do the sex. <laughs> Today's locker room talk and shots topic is from brothel boss to activist Madam Bella Cummins talks legalizing sex work, brothel life, and more. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be the madam of a brothel? I have. I may have had some fantasies here and there, and I have said since I launched this podcast mm, three and a half, almost four years ago, that um, I support sex workers and sex work as uh, being legalized. Now, I only learned about the existence of brothels maybe five, 10, 15 years ago when I stumbled across a show on HBO. I think it was called The Cat House or something like that, and it was run by what I thought at the time was a pretty... Um, repulsive man. So I was thrilled when I found out uh, that there is a brothel in Nevada that is run by a lovely woman, a madame. And I believe, and she will correct me if I'm wrong, she is one of the longest running madams in the U.S. My guest today is Madam Bella Cummins. She is the owner of Bella's Hacienda Ranch, a legal brothel in Wells, Nevada. She is also the founder of the Onesta Foundation, a nonprofit organization with a mission to support Nevada sex workers and advocate for prostitution legalization throughout the United States. Thank you for joining me. Uh, will you take a moment to introduce yourself to my listeners and tell them just a little bit more about you? Well, thanks for having me on, Annette. And I am uh, Madam Bella Cummins, and I have been the owner and Madam of Bella's Hacienda Ranch for 38 years, which makes me the longest serving Madam in the country and still alive, which is great. Uh, and running, running a brothel is is still a business, running a business. However, it's dealing with the one area in the world that is the largest industry on the globe and is the most unregulated, non-taxed industry that's ever been. You have a lot to share with us today. We're going to learn all about what you do, what uh, life as a madame of a, I'm saying madame, I know it's madam, but I like throwing the little spin on it, <laughs> the brothel is right. like, but we're also going to talk about sex work and legalization of sex work and why that's so important. Um, this is an in-depth inside look uh, at something that not many of us necessarily get a chance to truly understand or see. So listeners, stay for the ride. This is going to be a fun one. It's going to be informative, and hopefully we will get you all on board to support legalizing sex work. Let's get ready to talk about brothels and sex work. Cheers. Yes, cheers. I want to begin by talking about your ranch and how you became a madam of a, a brothel. Well, I actually went to college for something totally different, but um, I also had a restaurant for a short period of time, and it just so happened that it was in the Mount House area of Nevada, and uh, that's actually where that cat house with uh, Dennis Hoff was created, but that was, I was there earlier, obviously. I was in there in the early 80s, and then I stepped on as uh, Madame Bella in 1987, but I met a man who was uh, a bit older than I was, and he had been romanced, if you will, into buying what was then Hacienda as a silent partner. Well, it turned out that after, I'm going to say a few years, that, that being a silent partner wasn't working out well. And so it was step in and take the silent out of it so that it could be run correctly. Well, he needed for me to step up and learn how it worked. In other words, how how the book work look? What did it cost to turn the key in the door? And you know, where was the money going type of thing? So that really wasn't my expertise, but it learned to be my expertise. And I realized what needed to happen in order for it to be run as a business. And yes, it's sex work, but anytime there's an exchange of money for services, it is still a business. So it should be approached like that. Uh, I, I liken it to being like a hairdressing salon. They come in, they have, they have a station, 
or a room. They have business licenses. They have this this whole protocol they have to follow in order to be uh, legal licensed uh, entrepreneurs in this sensual so sexual service industry. And, and so it, there's a lot to it for them besides making the choice to step into this type of business. And of course, typically it's for younger women that need to transition and go on and do something else. But as far as me stepping on to this this idea of the brothel industry, uh, I did most everything wrong before I got it right. And uh, it, it has been my platform for growth. You started working while your husband at the time owned it. Now you run it fully, correct? Yes. Well, he was, as I said, a little bit older than I. And he, as long as he was healthy enough, it, it was, I'm going to say his to run because I wanted him to leave the planet with dignity and to figure out how to make it successful, even though I was somewhat of the driving force in having him follow a guideline so it would be so. But when he finally passed, it, it was a, the reins came into my hands and it was mine to do uh, everything incorrect till I got it right. And how long ago was that? It was really the 1990s when, you know, I was, I was there alone instead of slightly in the background or, or right beside him, you know? So, and it was, it was difficult at times because he, he had other ideas than I did. And I had other, I had this idea of empowerment and he had this idea of, could he just be successful running it? He was put in a position at an age where he couldn't really do what Dennis Hoff did, which was look at it more like a candy store instead of a way to empower women. He did, he did get there and God bless. I'm glad he did where he was more of a, a leader figure. Could you talk to me a little bit about how your vision of empowerment, a brothel house being empowerment for the sex workers there, the women there, how did that look different than what was being done prior? I assume a lot of brothels have been run by men. So I'm curious about what changes you wanted to make in order to make it more empowering. The transition of this industry has been huge. And because we owed so much money, there was like three mortgages, our home was mortgaged. I mean, financially, we, we, were, we were not in good shape. And so there was parts of running the business that had to be about money, had to be about attracting the correct women that would, would help uh, with all the financial obligations. Uh, and yet my vision was looking at the era, which was pimp and pretty much street type ladies. And when you look at that, when, and that, those are the ladies coming in, it, it's different because I, I, I'm watching this money go from their hands to someone else's hands. And my, in my mind, you know, in my thirties, I'm thinking, you might be in your 20s, but there's going to come a day when you're not going to have anything. And you've taken the very best years of your life, made this incredible amount of money, and you have none. And so my whole out, outlook or vision went to ladies. Ladies get to learn how to be businesswomen on their own, never needing to be attached to someone in order to be successful. The, the idea is how to take young women and help them take this incredible amount of money that they make and, and not just run through it. And mm -hmm. I mean, they could have, back then they were giving it to somebody, but now it's like you've, they've got to learn this. I, I get the purse, I get the shoes, I get this stuff, but that it's like it gets to stop where what's the next vision? What are your dreams and goals? Um, learning that that their gift, 
that they have of being in service to others creates this financial security if they choose. So you basically are teaching them the business end of life. Like right now, how to be an entrepreneur using their skills as a sensual worker uh, and then what to do with that money and how to move themselves to whatever they're going to do next. Yes, what, whatever's important on their path. You know, and if we, if we're to look at setting a goal, all right, let's say we're going to write it down. In, in two weeks, I'm going to make, uh, we'll just pick $10,000. I would say, that's great. What do you plan to exchange for the money? It, it isn't the sensual sexual services. It's the very best experience she has to offer a client today without knowing if there's penetration, it, without knowing what it is she's really going to exchange. And once they, they gather that concept, it, it's as if more happens behind that closed door than just sex. Because I would say, you know, rarely are people satisfied or really just looking for penis and vagina pounding sex and done. I mean, that's like a 15 minute deal, right? Most people are looking for more than just sex when they are even, you know, when they are hiring a sensual worker, they're looking for connection, intimacy, sometimes uh, just touch, like something that they can't get in their life. I, I absolutely agree with you. There's more communication. There's more laughter. So you've taught them how to really look at what they're doing as a business and the quality of services that they're giving and what the meaning is attached with that, which I think is hard because we live in a society that shames women for enjoying sex, period, even when they're not receiving money for it, right? Like if you look at sex as something outside of uh, just getting pounded by a man to have a baby and you want to have fun with it and play and get maybe a little kinky or spicy or, you know, do some, some, some fun stuff, then suddenly you're a whore. So then you take a woman who's actually using her skills as a sensual artist to serve a client and it's hard for them to see past, I'm sure, at first, the shame of it because they're doing something that's shamed for women in the first place and illegal in most places. Um, and so you're adding some integrity to that in their mind and then showing them how to run it like a business. You going, you brought up haircutting. People come in for haircuts, but they end up coming back to the same person and tipping the same person large amount of monies because the hairdresser talks to them and gets to know their personal story and laughs with them and cries with them. I mean, I know so many people who become best friends with their hairdresser because it's really the connection around that physical activity, which is cut the business part, the cutting the hair that creates the experience, right? And so you, that sounds to me like what you're saying is you added that knowledge base and the integrity. There is so much psychology involved in any successful business adventure. And if you don't have some psychology, your goal, a person or a business is going to fail the, the psychology of being in service. And when it comes to our real reason to be in these bodies, we're only, we're really here for the touch we aren't here to see how hard we can work. I look at this courtesan situation. If, if they're really, you know, that that courtesiana honesta part of the industry as parallel with the geisha. Can I pause you? Will you explain the terminology? Because a, a lot of my listeners and myself may not be familiar. What is a courtesan? What is a, the... O Onesta. The Onesta Foundation came from basically the 1500s, and it in Venice, the Cortigiana Onesta was the the premier courtesan of courtesans. 
Okay, the, and in the definition, it does mean prostitute, but of nobility and of that upper class, the clergy. And in the 1500s in Venice, there were many different tiers of sex workers. But when, when a woman was able to reach that particular level of in-service, she had access to literacy and to to what the women that were with the nobility had none of they they were illiterate they they had needles they had things like that to to do you know the the sewing and the the embroidery and all those things but when it came to anything except probably the childbearing and sitting in the royal court they were they they didn't have what these women that actually were sex workers had access to. So I looked at the women that work at, I'm just going to say Bella's Hacienda Ranch. They're educated. They, it isn't all college, but they, they've got gifts that make them the type of woman that others require. And they can, they can, they can morph into that and, and do it without it affecting them at the soul level of who they are. That is a skill, especially when we go back to what I was saying earlier about being raised in a society that tells you if you're good at sex, if you enjoy sex, if you enjoy sex with more than one person, if you enjoy sex just for pleasure, something is at core level uh, wrong with you, evil about you. And so these women are able to like know who they are at the core and perform their services, enjoy it, and not have that internal degradation happen because they know who they are. And, and I agree with you, Annette. And what I, I work to share with them, because I, even after all these years, I know that I am still incredibly judged. And being, you know, a, a woman that's really just a really nice person, I, I struggled with that until I realized that what other people had to say or thought about me was none of my business, that I was here to walk an incredibly important path. And I, failure was never in my vocabulary. It just meant that I, I needed to make a small course correction. And, you know, it's an, it's an interesting thing. Even now, I understand that there are people that would really like for my business to close. I'm going to say cancel clear. However, Hacienda, you know, in, in one building or, or a newer building or whatever, has been at that location for 75 years. Is there anything in Wells, Nevada that's been there with the same name for 75 years? And I'm going to say, I don't see it. So the first 1950 to 1970, there were no uh, legislative uh uh, codes that made it legal where they had this legal license that happened in 70 71 so by the time i came along in 87 i was still pretty new and so now i'm at this place where 38 years later and they're still looking at me like i could i'm what high crime i don't know i just look at them and go what are you thinking you know i, I bring a tremendous amount of revenue to the house by the location being there by having a great reputation by, by people like you. They give me a chance to speak. And these clients don't just come to Bella's and say, well, we're just going to spend our money here. That isn't how it happens. They go to restaurants. They get fuel. They stay in hotels. They, they may go to the grocery store. So there's all this other money that goes into the town. Right. So do you really want me gone? Right. It'd probably be a really bad idea because things dried up like the aridness of a desert during COVID. There was mm. nothing happening. And when I went to the city council and I said, uh, how about if I open as an escort? And they allowed it. 
Mm. And guess what happened? <gasps> Things started to flourish in town. My, my. I don't, you know, I don't need anyone to give me a, you know, an, a standing ovation. I just knew that it would help everybody. What's the difference between an escort and what you were doing before? There's really no difference except escort is time and companionship. And because brothels were never really allowed to reopen under COVID in, in uh, Nevada, COVID went away. They never really officially said, oh, you can open back up. Everybody else was. So by being an escort from September of 2020 through July of 2021, I had people coming through the door. They didn't care if they watched a movie and ate popcorn or had a beer at the bar. They could talk. They could be together. It didn't have to be about sex penetration, all those things. That's where I learned that it was more sensual than sexual. And it worked. So I was open about seven months after we were closed down. And then I was finally open as a brothel like in July of 2021. And and of course, that's when sexual activity could begin. But all of those other houses were closed from what was it? Uh, I believe it was March until March 2020 till July of 2021. That's a long time to be closed. So what you're saying is it actually hurt the whole local economy by closing yeah. because so many people I've I've driven through those areas. I mean, there's just not a lot necessarily going on. So it makes sense that having the brothel there um, creates a destination that then feeds into the rest of the local economy. What I want to ask you now is, and I think what a lot of people want to know is, I'm just curious about what what a day in the brothel looks like. What does a day as a madam running a brothel look like? Well, first of all, Bella's is, uh, cap it, it has room for about 14 ladies. We're classified as a medium size house. And really there's only one medium size house. Otherwise they're very small and in uh, more quiet locations as far as being able to attract clients or there's the really big ones. And the really big ones are uh, have policies that are locked down, where you go in and you don't get out till the end of your contract type of thing, or you're with the runner, or you you know, so, and I'm gonna say you can pay for everything to be provided, whether it's food or laundry or cleaning a room or whatever. And um, at Bella's, the ladies come in, they live, they live right there for mm -hmm. let's, we'll, we'll pick two weeks. Some stay longer. So when they're there, there is uh, there is a contract that that it, it they sign that says this is a rooming house. You know, it's um, thirty dollars a day for your room, and you know how long you're going to stay. Uh, because in the original NRS statutes we were called rooming houses. So it's just that little piece of paper that says, yep, you're at a rooming house and you're, here's your station, here's your room. This is what you're gonna put your business license in and all of that. So when, let's just say, when, when I come into the brothel, I'm looking to make sure everyone has all their documents, that everyone is, I, I'm gonna say prepared, prepared for the day. And uh, if the doorbell rings, we are a lineup house. And what that means is the ladies would assemble in the parlor and they would go out in a line, introduce themselves one at a time. And then the hostess who would be sitting somewhere near the client would say, you know, please choose a lady. Uh, you can talk to as many as you would like to find your energetic match. And, uh, but, you know, start with one. And so he'll choose a lady and she'll give him uh, a, a tour if he's never been there before. So he sees what's available in the house. And then, of course, they get to sit down and talk about prices and services. What's he looking for? What's he willing to spend on himself? 
uh, the other part of my duties is making sure that everything is operational in the house, you know, or, you know, that whether it's mechanical or whatever it is that, that I provide for that rent, which is, you know, all of the utilities and, and uh, obviously that's what makes it similar to a hairdressing salon. There's insurance, there's utilities, there's insurance, there's all those things that, you know, you have to have licensing, all of that. And then I am also available for any of them that needs part of my time, part of my mentorship, because they are, they haven't lived as long as I have. So I know what it's like to be their age, but they have no idea what it's like and what the wisdom that I have when they're ready to, to ask or, or need part of that. They still have to make their own growth, but I might and usually have the information that they're looking for in order to be more successful, in order to be an even better courtesan. What is the age range of the women that come there and work there? Well, we have an age starting point of 21. And the 20s are, uh, of course, a, a popular time to step into the industry. Uh, 30s, 30s are like the easiest because they already went through the, where's the money? <laughs> And so they're really, really ready to listen and, and go, okay, I've got it. Uh, and even like the, the later 20s are like that. But in the very beginning, when they're 20 to 24, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a ridiculous amount of money that falls into their hands. And it's, you know, there's times when I go, you know, you could put some of that in the safe. You could put some of that in the CD. You could put some of that in something else. But um you know they get to they get to sow a few wild oats as well. I just work to have them work to rein it in as soon as they're able, so that they never have a time when they they look in their wallet and the moths fly out. Do you have women in no, their forties? No, no, no. Do you have women in their fifties? No. Just out of curiosity, forties, um, typically forty to forty four, maybe, but maybe a enough. person has to have taken care of themselves you know you can't do the heavy drinking and the smoking and the drugs and the stuff i mean body does the, the body falls apart <laughs> our skin does things unimaginable when we fail to take care of it how many yeah. in one day how many clients do you usually see how many men women come through the door looking for uh, uh, a woman it could be 15 or 20 on a, on a quieter day. And it could be 25 to 40 on a busier day uh, or more. But, you know, it's like, and I always look at that and I multiply it times a week. And then I think about, well, how did that help them? And then how did that help the town? And here's the other part of empowerment that I really want to make sure I, I talk about because it's a it's a big thing for me, all right? Many, many businesses that that have things backwards think that it's about the money, all right? And, and maybe other brothels are like this where, you know, if you don't make enough money for the house, well, then you aren't going to be invited back, all right? Which means... It isn't about helping the women become empowered and become better at what they are choosing to do. So my philosophy is I get to help them. And in return, they have something to share. But it depends on my ability to help them and for them to hear me as they're making this personal growth that has to happen. And as they become better in-service courtesans, the more their money goes up. So they are first. And they get, they get to be first instead of how much money can you bring out of someone. Now, what's the longest amount of time 
a woman can stay there and work? I do have ladies that go home a couple of times a year. It's a, it depends on how a woman is wired. You know, some of them, it, it costs more energy for them as they're working to become this professional in-service provider. And others, it comes more naturally. And, you know, I liken that to two books I've read, like on mastery, where it wasn't the person that it came the most natural to that stuck with it and, and became the Cartagena Onesta. It was someone that it wasn't natural to them. They had to really work to, to step into, uh, I'm going to say, uh, an energy where they could do what they wanted to do and and find find that excellence within them that wasn't just somehow this god gift they're it 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 just didn't come natural but they wanted it they wanted to be in service so they didn't quit and they didn't mean they looked like barbie it didn't mean you know any of those things but it was a passion and we have to have what we have to have that and we have to have the follow through or we are we're never successful so people can basically stay and live there as long as they want to go home but then come back and it's up to them and some it sounds like some women are there for quite a long period of time are there some women that are yes. there for years yes but typically it's the the younger ones it'll be Two months, three months, home a month. Uh, the majority are uh, two to three weeks on, a week to two weeks off. That's the majority. And you were saying they had to have licenses and stuff like that. What is required in order to work at a brothel? Well, to work at, at Bella's Hacienda Ranch, and our licensing comes from the city of Wells, uh, you have to have a picture ID that's valid and a social security card. You have to be able to provide it, okay? And the state requires uh, a state business license. That's good for a year. Uh, It's $200, and it's actually a really good thing because it made what they do a legal business. But that right there, I have never yet seen a state that, granted something a business license and then took it away because they want the money and and that's okay that's okay costs money to run a government so they have that and then the city requires uh fingerprinting so that's an fbi check uh so you don't want to have warrants and outstanding things you know that you should have taken care of uh, and then once you have the fingerprints, uh, the city of Wells issues uh, a little yellow work card. And that work card is good for a year. And that is the fingerprinting and the work card right now are $75.25. Mm-hmm. And then the medical requirements are blood once a month and culture every week that you're there. Are condoms required? What What are the safety protocols that are put in place? Uh, condoms are mandatory. I think the one thing that young women aren't taught and they, they get to be is that anytime a condom is in use, and they should be, you have to have lubricant. So please, <sighs> any of you that are young and out there, don't expect to lubricate that thing yourself. Just Put it on there, and and that way you uh, you'll find that intercourse is actually really fun and a blessing, instead right. of uh, the awkwardness of this doesn't feel very good. So the women are tested. Do the clients that come in have to have any sort of like STI? Like what's the on their end? What's the protocol? There's always that visual uh, inspection you know, making sure there aren't visual things or, or any sort of uh, discharges of any kind. And, and the ladies are very uh, educated in what they're looking for. And from the very beginning of my career, 
the individuals that frequent brothels and the ladies that work as courtesans. They're clean. They want to stay clean. This is why, one of the reasons why they're doing it legally instead of out there. Disease is always on the rise out there, outside mm -hmm. of the house, you know, the brothel. And, you know, people take chances and they'll come up with some kind of STI and it it isn't worth it. There are just things out there, STIs out there, you have for the rest of your life. And I just I just feel that at this time in our in 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 history, unless unless someone really wants to play Russian roulette, right. utilize the technology that's out there. Uh, so I want to move on to your nonprofit and the goal of it and why you think legalizing sex work is so important and also the language around it. I'd love to have that discussion with you. I've been, as I said, in this industry for 38 years. You know, I, I was already in my 30s by the time I, I came into what I'd call Bella's Hacienda Ranch. And so, you know, that the question of, oh, did you ever work there? is like a moot point. I, I was I whatever I did, I did way before 1971. And so it I wasn't meant to, you know, be a woman that that went from being uh, a courtesan to working on the other side of the bar or having the name of madam given to me and yet I'm just an employee and all these men own the brothel or whatever it is. That that wasn't supposed to be my journey. So when when Dennis Hoff bought the Bunny Ranch, he somehow, and, and maybe it was through Larry Flint, but he got sort of this dark energy about it, it being a, an orgy. And, and, and these people that were attracted to him it made him look like he was our representative and he was not. He was actually one of those guys, just like on that show that said, oh, you know, as long as they say, don't say no, I, I'm going to go to bed with them. And that wasn't what the industry was about. It wasn't about owners dabbling with anyone they wanted to. It wasn't. These was this a career for these ladies. It got to be where he was his behavior was so out of alignment with all the rest of us. And we're just ducking, keeping our heads down at that. The, there were women that began to speak out that it was as if they had been taken advantage of. And at the same time, there was, uh, there was a lawsuit that came up wanting to close the brothels in that same County, Lyon County, and then Nye County which is down there by Pahrump. And, and it was like, well, well, that can't happen. So the Onesta moved into supporting, I'm going to say, the survival of the industry, that no one could come along and suddenly say that we were, uh, any, that we were attached to slavery or you know, illegal prostitution or trafficking or any of those things in any way. It, it, it's virtually impossible for anyone to be trafficked in a brothel. There's too many criterias that we've already talked about. So it they it has to be by choice for these women. So the Onesta, it, it didn't do what I thought it would do initially, and maybe it will sometime in the future. But the idea of it crossing state lines and giving clients a destination, women a destination, clients that learn about Bella's that are in all 50 states. It, I'm one location. If not that I need more locations, but if each state had certain rural areas or designated areas in a city, then it would be it, it would be something that would would help with public safety. What is, you refer to the Onesta. That's the nonprofit, right? Correct. And 
Correct. And what does the Onesta do? You said it came into, can you explain? So the Onesta is a nonprofit and what does it do exactly? It was designed to help keep these rural brothels in business. And even in Lyon County, it went so far as a vote to the people. Did they want them open or did they want them closed back in something like 18, 2018? And the people voted that they wanted them open. They didn't want them to go away. Since the conception of the Onesta Foundation, it was designed to help women understand more about if they wanted to step into this profession, what was it like? It couldn't be about the money. It The money happens, but they they have to have some kind of a calling or, the, or they're going to go away. It isn't going to be the industry for them. So there's, there's many, there's many things that I wanted the Onesta to be helpful about. And then mm-hmm. eventually I wanted it to be something that was like a reference point for people that wanted to know more about how it works, why it works, you know, why having it in your town would be a great thing. It doesn't mean everybody's going to go there, but in today's world, there's so many individuals that don't want a permanent relationship. Or mm-hmm. they they have no desire to get married again and split all their things again. Right. Or, or they have a, a partner, but the partner uh, doesn't want it anymore. Or they, uh, but they don't want a divorce, but they want right. to be able to live their life safely. So there's there's all these different reasons why individuals visit a brothel. Yeah, let me tell you, when dating men. I have so many times referred them to sex workers. I've been like, you need to not be on dating sites. You need to be finding a sex worker because you don't want a relationship. You're just looking for someone to take care of your sexual needs. And using women who are looking for relationships for that is really not ethical. But if you find and pay a sex worker, she's there to serve you, to like give you the connection and uh, intimacy you need. And the lines are clear. You're not taking something from someone and misleading them. And that's where I think, you know, sex workers do such a great service for people who need touch and intimacy, but aren't, you know, aren't willing to give the person doing it to them what that other person needs. Uh, But so I would love to ask you your stances and uh, the Onesta's stance is legalizing sex work will help with things like lowering sex trafficking, correct? I believe it will help. You know, I mean, the United States, within the borders of the United States, uh, so that's like Americans. It's like 95% of the trafficking is to Americans. Mm -hmm. there's, There's a problem. Right. And so how do you feel that legalizing prostitution um, and sex work will help with the the issues we have with trafficking? Well, first of all, people have desires. They're going to get them satisfied one way or another. And mm-hmm. because there are so many, I'm going to say, people that could even fall into that category of, of the very wealthy, the privileged they make it look like it's okay. And so it starts to drop down a tier and then another tier. And finally it gets into regular people where they just get into that circle. Well, at the very upper crust of there's no, there's no consequence. You know, look at Jeffrey Epstein, you know, I mean, there's no, well, I was so-and-so went, nothing happened to him. And then, you know, uh, all these other people go and, and it, it takes it, it takes on uh, something that's kind of like a disease where people start to fascinate about what was going on and and they bring it down into everyday communities and it's a manipulation and it's taking advantage of people and the young people that just disappear mm-hmm. what, 
they aren't all dead. I'm telling you, people do not know how freaking nuts rich people are and how unethical they are and how they will use their money to get their desires met in the most unethical of ways. It's insane and they and they can do that. And by regulating sex work so that the people that are doing the sex work are in control of their own lives, making their own money and don't need to fall prey to or depend on these folks. You're fixing a big part of the problem. You know, you can't have Disneyland without a location. Legalization is going to provide safety for the sex workers, but it also provides safety for the people seeking out sex workers uh, because they will be able to go at, to a place where it's all regulated, right? Uh, you're not like yes. doing everything in secret where someone can rip you off, take your money. You know, the safety goes both ways. You have you have public safety, which is those STIs, STDs. So, so, so that's eliminated. All right. And then you, there is a financial gain for the community. All right. That's an important part. It, it's a wonderful thing to want everything to be decriminalized. But how are you going to decriminalize if you don't then regulate and legalize? You, It won't work. It doesn't give you police protection. It doesn't give you public safety. It, 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 it never helps with what I call revenue. So anyone that's part of a group that's just beating a drum for decriminalization needs to be approaching it that it's a business and how it's going to help government. Don't look at it like it has anything to do with sex. It's a business. And then, and only then, can these people that want to be reelected say, it's business. I'm not going to be there, but let's regulate it. Let's collect the tax money. Let's have public safety at an all new level. And, and then they'll begin to break through that, that crust of what all of those legislative upper echelon people are doing behind a closed door that could be about trafficking. Right. Take the money from the taxes that you uh, earn and put it towards fighting trafficking. I don't know. There's an idea. Just a gal with a mic coming up with a brilliant idea. Perfect. So you know we have to we have to think about every we everything we do with our bodies is in exchange for money if we're going to thrive in this world. Whether you're a bricklayer or a garbage man or a, a computer programmer, you're still trading yourself for money. What's the difference? Oh, sex. Oh, well, and I think something that we need to talk about before we wrap this up is the reality is most sex workers are women and we are uh, using, you know, I always hear, especially when I get comments in my, my podcast episodes and I'm talking about when women want sex, men are always like, well, women are the one who control when sex happens. Women are the one who, who get to say when all of that. Okay, so maybe that's true, but it's interesting to me then that the thing that women supposedly have the most control over is now illegalized to use in exchange for money. It's definitely, I think, the illegalization of sex work is definitely a direct oppression of women, right? And women being able to say, like, when and how sex happens with them, what the exchange is for the sex that they do have. Um that's my perspective on it. I think it's a way to oppress women when it's a great way for women to, as you say, make a shit ton of money in a relatively short amount of time and then hopefully invest that in their future and, uh, you know, yeah. the life they want to make for themselves. There are people, women, probably men, maybe trans, that are absolutely gifted when it comes to that sensual sexual experience, they're just, they're just it. They got mm -hmm. it. And then there's all those other different levels, but you know, because I feel that 
that sex is more therapy than we let on. Absolutely. That <laughs> absolutely. That, it, that gets left out of the the equation. It's medicine. It's Sex not- is medicine. Pleasure is medicine. It's a medicine for the soul, for the mind, for the body. 100%. Very last question. I know that you're passionate about t- changing the language that that's used to describe. I think you said you'd like it changed and correct me if I'm wrong from prostitute to cortisone. What are some of the language shifts you like to see made around sex work? When an industry has legal, and it's a small, small little legal part, and it's in Nevada, there should be a designation that, that gives these women a different descriptive label, if you will. It how how can you call illegal sex workers by the same name as legal? There There's money here that has to be spent. They have to have clean records. There's all this criteria. They pay taxes. They do all this stuff. And, and you're going to put prostitute on them? Makes no sense. You couldn't tell them apart then. So courtesan means prostitute. But over here, if 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 a a pick a woman wanted to work independently. It, just the whole brothel thing wasn't going to work for her. Then what's the criteria for that? Oh, state business license, uh, uh, some kind of a work card, uh, valid medical clearances, current, always on her person when she went to do whatever it is. And that way, with all meeting all those same credentials, she wouldn't be a prostitute. She would be a legal businesswoman. So there's there's many ways to fix what is like a huge elephant. But in the areas that can have um, regulation and legalization, we should be doing that. You, we're not going to stop what happens in a back alley. There are things that can't be regulated and legalized, but in the areas where it's possible for the safety of all, then for heaven's sakes, do it. It's good for mankind, period, across the board. Right. And I think I read somewhere where you had said you would like it referred to as sensual work as opposed to sex work. Is that correct? Yes, sensual, sexual services. There is never a guarantee that there is going to be penetration. Maybe there's something about certain individuals that prevent that from happening at at certain Mm -hmm. times in their life. They Mm -hmm. they still have this great need to be with another. And, And it happens behind a closed door. And we label it sex work. Really? Is that really what happened? Probably no. Not for everyone. Well, thank you. This conversation has been very enlightening. And uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, share your story, but to walk listeners through what it what it's like to work at um, a brothel, a legal brothel, and and then everything that these women go through and what kind of support and guidance they get when they work at an establishment like yours, but also hopefully listeners will get from this, like some sort of understanding if they didn't already have it as to to why and how legalization of sex work, sensual work. I like, I like the switch there, um, why it should happen and how it can actually improve things for everybody involved. So, uh, now I would love for you to tell all of my listeners, viewers, where they can find you, uh, your hacienda, and all of the information. Oh, okay. So the website is bellas, B-E-L-L-A-S dot U-S, like United States. And we are, uh, X is Bella's Hacienda. That's the same, B-E-L-L-A-S, H-A-C-I-E-N-D-A. And, you know, link up to us and uh you know there's a a lot of 
great information on the things that I have done over the past year. So if if a person Googles, you know, Madam Bella or, or Madam Bella Cummins or Bella Cummins, you're going to see a lot of great articles and things that that expand on on some of what we were talking about. Um, there's a there's actually uh, in some of the articles that are current that about virginity being an epidemic, you know, it and it is people 19 or 18 to, to 20, was it four? Over 50% of the men are still virgins. And I, I link it to all of this cell phone, locking people away. Uh, you don't hardly go to college anymore. Everything's online. Uh, people are homeschooling more because you can't really get a decent education in public school. So all these things are changing how our young people are 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 developing and how their social skills and their ability to interact with one another are incredibly, uh, they aren't developing exactly at a normal rate. And so the, the, the number of virgins that we have come through Bella's Hacienda Ranch it's amazing. We probably have five or six in a week because we're right next to Utah and Idaho, the two most sexually repressed states in the union. So the idea is, you know, just understand it. It isn't about changing anyone's mind. It isn't about it being for everyone. It's about understanding that some people require services such as legal brothels. Yes. Well, thank you. So that's a fun little fact right there. All the dudes in Idaho losing their virginity at a brothel. Like, it makes sense. (laughs) That's that's a sexually repressed area. (laughs) Really, thank you for having me. This is thank you for joining. Fun Fun conversation. And I so appreciate you being here with me. Well, listeners, I feel like you learned a lot. This this is definitely a highlight of of the conversations I've had over the past three and a half years. I'm I've really enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining me and listeners until next time I'll see you in the locker room (laughs) cheers cheers